Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining me. This is going to be a different kind of video than my typical playthroughs. I wanted to talk about something that has been bothering me for the last several years regarding Call of Duty multiplayer. So I'm a big fan of Call of Duty. I've been playing the multiplayer for many years. I've played consistently since Advanced Warfare, but I uh, have fond memories as well of the older Call of Duties, you know, kind of the Modern Warfare 2, Black Ops 2 era. But I find that I haven't played Call of Duty with the same amount of consistency or the same enjoyment as I have uh, as a result of the last several iterations. And I wanted to talk about some of my thoughts regarding them. I kind of put my ideas onto paper and explore my, my apathy and my discontent with the franchise as it's been in the last several years. So this is going to be different than my usual videos. This is more of a video essay thing, which I know there's a million of these out there. I know people have a lot of different thoughts about Call of Duty. Consider this uh, just another another piece of shit adding to the pile of shit. But with that being said, I want to talk about a few things that I think are important as far as breaking down what exactly has been wrong with the franchise, how it's kind of been led astray from its more popular iterations. And this video will be my attempt to do so, to explain the factors that I feel have contributed to the sense of apathy that Call of Duty has given me throughout the last several releases. Let's start with a little bit of background information. At the time of recording, we are just a couple of days away from the release of Black Ops 6, which, for those of you keeping track, is the 21st mainline entry in the series. Over those releases, COD has routinely given us some of the most memorable, chaotic, and enjoyable experiences in all of gaming. I think people still underestimate the value that this franchise has had, the creativity that it's generally given us, and also the replayability that it's had despite being an annual release for two decades. Consider as well that Call of Duty is routinely the best-selling game year after year. Obviously, there's something special about this, but the problem that I feel is not really reflected in the numbers. It's not necessarily reflected in the sales, and it's something underneath. It's this quiet resentment, this sense of apathy that I feel has been building up throughout the years. But in the last few iterations, I've noticed that these characteristics, the replayability, the value of it, and certainly the creativity, have been decreasing. It feels like with each passing year, COD has become less entertaining, less engaging, and less unique. And I feel very strongly that the development of my apathy towards this series ironically began just at the moment when COD was trying to reverse this decline and reinvent itself. I'd like to begin with what I consider to be one of the worst Call of Duty games, the reboot of Infinity Ward's Modern Warfare, released in 2019. My distaste for this game's multiplayer comes from a number of factors, most notably from what I'll call the design philosophy of the game. Now what do I mean by this? I would describe this as the means in which the game can be interacted with by the player and the intentions behind the inclusion of those means. These are the tools that the player has at their disposal to make the experience fun and unique to them. Design philosophy, particularly in a multiplayer game like Call of Duty, includes things such as the weapons, attachments, perks and kill streaks, progression, map design, and the overall means of combat engagements. It also includes the intentions behind the developer's decisions in making those elements part of the game. Now there is an argument to be made that any series, especially one like Call of Duty, is always going to have a problem with design philosophy in the sense that it will always inherently struggle with replayability and uniqueness, to a certain point, especially after many entries and iterations. It's fair to say, for example, there are only so many ways you can make and therefore play a small to medium three lane map, where everyone is using the same handful of weapons before it eventually becomes stagnant. I would add that a significant portion of the player base year after year has stopped playing Call of Duty by the six month mark in its life cycle. The point where many players have gotten everything there is to get out of the game and are no longer engaged. But why do I single out Modern Warfare as the beginning of the decline? It's because the design philosophy seems to be made with intentions that are fundamentally at odds with the way an arcade shooter like Call of Duty has been made previously. 
as well as the overall satisfaction and control that the player has over the things happening in the game. I'm going to chalk up design philosophy to three things in particular. The map design, loadouts and player characteristics, and player progression and incentives. Now I gave an example earlier about a certain kind of map design, that being the small to medium three lane map. It's true that this design is not always a hit, especially in a game or multiple games in a row where this is the primary or perhaps only style of map available. With that being said, you want to know why this design is often far more appealing even after over a dozen Call of Duties? It's because it's fucking fun. It's simplistic, predictable enough to know what you're getting overall, but chaotic enough that each game on the map is stimulating. Map designs that follow the structure tend to allow for more engagements more frequently. This in turn helps drive the addicting feeling that is central to the COD formula. These maps tend to have a good balance of chaotic fun and strategic maneuvering across multiple engagements, and can be utilized by both casual players who, let's say, mindlessly run down a lane, or higher skilled players who have quicker reflexes and a greater presence on the map. Map design is also important because it offers the potential for unique engagements unlike those in other maps, as well as interesting styles or aesthetics that help it stand out. What makes a map fun, and eventually memorable, includes the things you can do or the things that you are looking at, but which are still unique and enjoyable even after many games on the same map. A classic example that blends both of these aspects perfectly is Nuketown. How is it that this map, which has had the same layout 14 years after release across 5 different games, still feels more replayable than most recent maps? It's because, despite the overall 3 lane structure, the design doesn't feel like it's trying to force certain types of encounters beyond go this way and find enemy. Virtually any playstyle is viable, and even if it isn't a very good one, it doesn't matter because you'll have so many opportunities to try again due to the size and structure of the map. It's very easy to just run right back into the action. This map also has a unique colorful design which has changed over the years in an attempt to keep it fresh, and successfully in my opinion. Another good example is Rust an iconic map that has since had multiple iterations, but each one still feels both replayable and distinct from its other versions, despite having the same layout. The map feels unique and has a lot of variety in its layout, which in turn gives replayability based on your loadout and playstyle. How about something like Shipment? It doesn't get any more simple than this, but the map is unique from everything else in its size, while still allowing for the player to use any strategy, any weapon, or any attachment. The reason people keep wanting these maps in the new games is because you know what to expect, but those expectations are for positive reasons rather than negative. Good map design is like a good experiment. It knows the style, layout, and types of engagements it wants on it, it's replayable, and it's made with the idea of players having full control over the experience. With these ideas in mind, let's turn to Modern Warfare, and by extension the CODs that have been released since. What is it about this game's maps that are just so out of line with these ideas? Well, first and foremost, it's the size of the maps. The maps in Modern Warfare overall feel much bigger than many other maps in the franchise. And while some games have had larger maps that are looked at more fondly, some more than others, obviously, I think the overall structure in Modern Warfare's maps challenges the core formula of COD by simply reducing encounters, reducing the chance for that addicting and satisfying feeling to occur, and often by a good amount. Now, why might that be the case? Well, because even when the maps in this game and those that have followed it have a general three lane structure, the size of the map itself means you aren't getting through these lanes as quickly. You also have the downside of potentially having to run around the map for much longer or having to camp and wait for others to show up, assuming they show up at all. This is all time that is away from the action. The size of the maps generally have the effect of discouraging movement because it becomes much easier to wait for other players to waste their time covering the distance of the map rather than yourself having to be the one to seek out gunfights. The amount of corners, sight lines down these lanes, and overall places that the player who is moving needs to check, compared to the person who, say, watches a lane from the corner, is more tedious than anything. The reality of this is also that as players inevitably seek out the strategy of convenience, or the path of success with the least resistance, more and more players will simply choose to wait for someone else to run into them rather than run the gauntlet themselves. The cumulative effect of a significant number, perhaps even a majority of players doing this in any given game, means that gunfights are increasingly infrequent, and when you do come across them, they feel like they matter more because you encounter them less. This makes it all the more frustrating if you end up losing it. It's like supply and demand, a tale as old as time. The less gunfights you have, the more coveted they become. 
The problem is that the design philosophy behind the map design seems to suggest that the most rewarding way to earn those coveted gunfights to begin with is to let other players maneuver the map rather than yourself. Now the big question is, is this unique to Modern Warfare and the newer games? Not necessarily. Camping has existed longer than COD has. It's important to note that this is just one contribution to a greater problem with the overall pacing of the games. It's not so much the effect that this has alone on slowing down the game, but how it compounds with other problems. Losing multiple of these infrequent gunfights in a game, especially against players utilizing what we'll call more viable strategies, we'll talk about that later, is unsatisfying and eventually gets boring. It's a fact of life to come across challenges or things that feel unfair. Yes, even in video games that are for entertainment purposes. Often the reward itself is overcoming that challenge and say, winning the game, having a positive KD, besting the players who caused you frustration. But what happens if this tedious, meticulous process of checking every corner, every window, being hyper-focused on who stands out in the background, plays out in nearly every game that you play? Like the problems compounding, the boredom and frustration also compound. And the only solution is to avoid the maps that help contribute to them. This is exactly why maps like Newtown and Shipment are so beloved, in part because they don't feel like they include the stagnant design philosophy. The supply of gunfights is plentiful, and so in those cases where you do lose them, it feels less discouraging because the opportunity for another one is easily obtainable. Another key function to the map design in recent CODs is the inclusion of doors and the ability to mount on most things within the map. Now what does this look like exactly? Let's say you're walking into the middle of the play space, and in order to proceed, you have to open a closed door. What's behind the door? Well, in most cases, it's probably unclear, or if you do suspect an enemy is near, it's hard to determine where exactly behind the door they are. What this does then is it forces you to make a decision. You can either walk away from the door entirely, which may be the only way to progress on that portion of the map, thus wasting your time, wait at the door for somebody else to open it, also potentially wasting your time, or open the door yourself, either slowly or by barging through, potentially getting you killed, and again wasting your time. Now this sequence itself isn't such a big deal. You could even argue that a similar process unfolds in small three-lane maps because you have to make a decision on whether you want to move up or not. The problem with this setup, however, is derived from both the consequence of the choice and the process itself. Now what do I mean by this? Well, particularly on larger maps, doors have a cumulative slowing effect on all players, because ultimately, all players will need to make these decisions and risk the consequences of another death, and the subsequent use of time to get back to the place on the map or go elsewhere. This is especially true on said larger maps because of the extra time it takes to get back to that location and get a potential kill. It's even further a problem because during that extra time, if you were unsuccessful in ousting the enemy from their location, they now have time to reset the door and the process starts over. Do you push them again? wait for someone else to move ahead for you, or camp on the other side of the door, wait for movement yourself, and just play chicken with them. Especially as this type of encounter is commonplace because of the sheer quantity of doors, I feel particularly frustrated for two reasons. Number one, I feel like I'm forced to play a certain way, which happens to be slow paced. I prefer run and gun style rather than camping, but this gameplay device forces me to pause, and usually many times throughout the game, or put myself in a disadvantageous gunfight. And number two, because what it does is it also blends the experiences of all players and all maps into this particular style of either let's camp and wait or let's not bother at all, rather than allowing players more freedom to have unique ways of dealing with situations. Mounting essentially functions as the same device on the map. If you can mount on virtually any surface for a major increase to your weapon's accuracy, and if there are so many sight lines, corners, and obscure locations to wait while mounted in the lanes, why would you put yourself at a potential gunfight disadvantage by running into someone who is already mounted and waiting? The concept of lanes is key to a map's design in any game, not just Call of Duty. But remember, these lanes are much larger in newer games due to the size of some of the maps. Combine this with the idea of doors creating an artificial pause at choke points within the lanes, and then add mounting which gives you a benefit over others who aren't mounted. What's the end result? The size of the maps, doors, and mounting all individually act as a means of artificially slowing the pacing of the game. But even in maps where the size is not necessarily a factor, specifically in re-released maps within the recent COD games, it's important to note that the design philosophy overall 
which in these cases would mean devices such as mounting your doors, usually contradict the design of the original experience. Remember that the size and layout of the maps are their own contributing factors to the overall experience. And if in conjunction with the others, it makes the experience frustrating or not fun, then something would need to change. This is why, in response to negative feedback about the original maps on launch, recent COD games released a plethora of remastered maps over the course of their seasons. Modern Warfare in particular released fan favorites such as Backlot, Crash, and Vacant, among others. Cold War and Vanguard each brought back a slew of fan favorite maps such as Raid and Hijacked, as did Modern Warfare 2. The problem is that you can't take maps from other games built with fundamentally different player experiences in mind, throw them into a new game, and expect players to be able to replicate those fun experiences. This demonstrates that the modern design philosophy regarding these gameplay devices, the means in which the player can interact with the game, instead feel like restrictions on the type of encounters, the number of encounters, and viable strategies within those encounters, ultimately contributing to an increasingly boring, tedious, sluggish experience. Another important factor for map design is how a map looks visually. Does it have a unique theme or aesthetic? Is it easy to see other players in the play space? Are there interesting and memorable things to do on the map that make it distinct? Does it have a unique style or layout? The unfortunate reality is that modern COD games have had great difficulty in achieving most or even a couple of these. And I believe the Modern Warfare games are the least impressive in this regard. The maps are just so fucking bland. I wish I could describe these with any kind of accuracy, but outside of a couple like the cave map or the bridge map, I find it difficult to even paint the most basic picture of what the maps offer, much more actually name them. At the time of recording this section, I had yet to go back and record footage on these maps. The consequence is that I can't name a single one of these off the top of my head. The same is almost universally true with every COD since Modern Warfare. And while you could chalk this up to me not playing them as much as previous games, I think it's a testament to just how forgettable and uninspiring they are. I would also argue that a contributing factor to this is the overall lack of color or unique set pieces within these maps. I'll talk more about developers' intentions later, but in the case of the maps, it seems to me that the developers wanted to make Modern Warfare more like a milsim game, rather than the traditional arcade shooter. What's the overall consequence of this? Everything is a disgusting mix of grays, browns, and dark greens. Virtually nothing on the maps stand out, and it's difficult to visually see people. When you couple this with what we discussed earlier regarding players being unlikely to move much due to the size of the maps and the benefits of mounting, what you get is an experience where it's hard to even see the people you're fighting unless you wait for them to run up to you. It's yet another decision that has the effect of slowing things down, because in many cases you're having to carefully scan every part of the screen in front of you, every sightline, corner, or window, as enemies blend into the environment with ease. The result of this? You're incentivized to move less and blend into the environment with ease, reducing the potential for gunfights even further. What this ultimately makes me feel is that I'm constantly playing on maps that all look, play, and feel similar to one another, and for reasons that feel antithetical to a casual, engaging, and fun gameplay loop. It's kinda hard to give a shit about any particular map when I can get the same experience, and often a boring one at that, from pretty much any other map that I play in these games. On top of that, the experience is methodical and frustrating. It's hard to put into words how unfun it is to crouch walk around every corner, having to glance at four different sight lines where enemies could be mounted up and waiting. Assuming that you and your opponent are equally skilled, more on that later, this again has the cumulative effect of making nearly every gunfight across multiple games feel like an uphill battle. The positive feedback loop then becomes more infrequent and more challenging to obtain, leading myself and perhaps many of you to ask, is it even worth playing? Now another major problem I have with modern COD games are the loadouts and what I'll call the player characteristics. In my opinion, modern COD games have had a particularly stagnating feeling around their loadouts, as well as viable playstyles stemming from both of these. Now what do I mean by this? Well, let's start with the basics, the create a class system. I personally feel that the gunsmith system is inferior to the create a class system. I think that the system contributes to a feeling of apathy because in giving so many choices, it actually takes away player agency and the uniqueness of loadouts. This might seem counterintuitive given that players have a plethora of options to make their weapons unique up to a certain point, more on that later, but I feel that part of the enjoyment of COD multiplayer stems from the sentiment that less is more. 
Why should I give a shit about most of these attachments when only a few would fit my playstyle or be statistically better than others anyway? Weapon customization in the past was more based on particular decisions despite having vastly fewer options. This also meant that what you did decide on was more impactful because you could only have so many attachments and each one filled a more distinct role. Let's take a look at Black Ops 2 as an example. Weapons by default could have two attachments for primaries and one attachment for secondaries, and only had about 10 attachments to choose from. Therefore, you had to carefully consider what attachment best fits your playstyle while also accounting for the type of weapon, the rest of your loadout, and even the map or mode that you were playing. A silencer would be very useful in something like Search and Destroy, but comes at the cost of weapon range. If you wanted to further enhance your stealthy approach, you would have to split your class points more carefully amongst your perks, which might also depend on your weapon class and preferred playstyle. Extended mags would be useful on a weapon like the Scorpion due to its fire rate, but less so on the PDW which has a larger mag by default. Select fire might be helpful for some players using the FAL or the SMR, but is unnecessary for most other weapons. Rapid fire is less useful on the LSW but more so on every other LMG. How about something like Marathon and Lightweight? Well if you aren't moving around much as you would like in the newer CODs, you might not even bother with these, but if you are moving around, they could be especially useful in getting to objectives or power positions faster. Scavenger is good for most scenarios, but is less necessary for snipers, which tend to have higher damage and accuracy, or LMGs which have more ammo overall. Do we have any of these considerations in class customization in the newer games? Eh, not really. It's basically a matter of deciding what weapon class you want. Despite having all these options, the attachments are all practically the same and make the guns function similarly anyway. Weapon classes in previous games felt more distinct from one another, and perks and attachments were a means of accounting for trade-offs that were inherent and unique to the weapons. Loadouts have to compensate for a number of factors between the weapons, attachments, and perks, including but not limited to movement speed, ADS speed, reload speed, weapon recoil, mag size, fire rate, swap speed, damage range, and presence on the radar. When you have the ability to address any five of these characteristics at once, you can make your weapon function like any other weapon class without any trade-offs or uniqueness. Remember that on top of all of this you also have the option of mounting, which gives even the most inaccurately made weapon a major boost. Might as well close your eyes and pick at random. None of the perks are as impactful either with the possible exceptions of Ghost, Flak Jacket, or maybe Ninja if it's available. There's just nothing special to the system, and because every gun can have so many attachments, there aren't any trade-offs, strengths, or weaknesses to anything in particular, which makes every loadout amongst players practically the same. No need for scavenger when you can spawn in with an ammo box or just pick up another gun with full attachments. Why bother with blind eye or cold blooded when you're incentivized to hide in a building anyway? Who needs ninja or tracker if no one is planning on moving to begin with? Traditional weapons benefits and characteristics are also affected by the design philosophy. Movement penalties are either obsolete since no one is moving, or altered by the dozens of attachments to the point where everything functions the same as everything else anyway. I'll admit that the gunsmith was interesting when it first came out in Modern Warfare, but like a lot of other shit in the game, including those since, it became tedious and underwhelming pretty quickly once I realized how shallow and lacking in substance it is, especially as a core part of the design philosophy. Weapons and attachments are just as important as the space you are using them in, but when your loadout is either completely interchangeable with others, or not adhering to the artificially slow pacing of the game, it makes it feel neither unique nor impactful. And with us now coming up on the 6th iteration of Gunsmith, it makes me lose some desire to play with more than a handful of weapons, as it all starts to feel the same, and at an increasingly earlier point in the game's life cycle, as each new release includes it. Now aside from the gunsmith and its lack of depth, let's talk about the specifics of the loadout and what actually works considering the way the rest of the game was designed. COD games since Modern Warfare seem to be designed to appeal to the lowest common denominator in just about every capacity. Now yes, I understand we're talking about COD here, which has essentially functioned as a glorified babysitter for most of its releases, but the new games in particular feel like they're made to be as non-eventful as possible. Now what do I mean by this? Well, consider my earlier points about the map design and the devices within, and how the choices have a cumulative slowing effect on the gameplay. How can a franchise designed to be action-packed now have a design philosophy that reduces the frequency of action occurring? It happens to be that this design was intentional in the sense that, for the development of Modern Warfare, the devs wanted to make a game where every player could succeed. 
Is the balanced matchmaking a priority for modern warfare? Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the things we, we really want to do with this game is we want to we want to get new players in the game and we want them to kind of like, we don't want them to just get punched punched in the mouth over and over again mm -hmm. until they leave. We want a healthy ecosystem. We want a lot of players in and having fun. And that's a, that's a big focus for us. It's a big focus for us in weapon design. It's a big focus for us in level design. Um, our weapons are a bit more lethal than uh, they were in, in the Black Ops, the recent more Black Ops. And that helps a, a lower skilled player get a kill when they otherwise wouldn't have some success and then feel like now there's a desire to get better and to get another kill. Uh, our maps are a little bit more por porous um, and, you know, we want those players to have a, a safe place to, to take their time, to learn how to turn and move and then shoot, put those pieces together. And then they see someone and be like, oh, OK, now I can do this. So, yeah, it's a big it's a big focus for us. How does this philosophy work? Well, in real life application, the way to condense, for example, the gap in success between the smart students and the dumb students involves one of two things. You can either increase the intelligence of the dumb students through learning so that they start earning good grades naturally, or you lower the standards artificially for everybody so that anybody can pass the test. I would argue that COD now functions on a similar wavelength in the ways that success, and therefore in the developer's eyes, fun, can be achieved. Let me explain. Earlier I talked about the map design and the impact that doors have in conjunction with the size and sightlines of the maps. Realistically, any player can succeed with the strategy of waiting on one side of a door or up in a window for something to happen, but some players will still be better at maneuvering those situations than others. So how can we whittle down that skill gap even further? By giving the worst players more tools to mitigate the possibility of losing in those situations. This is where we arrive at our more viable strategies. Mounting is already a great example of this, but let's consider another. Let's say the good player, your A plus honor roll, teacher's pet looking motherfucker is moving through the lane towards the enemy spawn. It took him a while to get to the other half of the map because he has to treat every door, every corner, and every window as a potential place where somebody is waiting, hiding and blending in with the background of the room. He now comes across another door. What's behind the door? We're not sure, but he doesn't want to peek through every door in the game as if the fun is going to jump scare him. No, he wants that satisfying gameplay loop that COD is known for. Moments of action, tension, satisfaction. But what happens instead? Precision airstrike, ready. Him dead. He dies to a claymore. Now what happens if this scenario can occur with practically any area on the map, door or not? It further contributes to the slow pacing of the game because now we have an extra factor on top of the other ones what the enemy player brought with them in their loadout. Or, put another way, what they were incentivized to bring. Arguably, this scenario is neither unique or even unusual. Every COD game, new or old, small map or big, doors or no doors can have this happen. So why is it worth mentioning with regards to the newer games? Because the scenario was previously the outlier, not the heavily incentivized norm as it currently is. Modern Warfare in particular has a design philosophy that rewards this playstyle compared to others, but the effects have largely remained the same in the games that have followed. This is due to a few different things related to both loadout tools and player characteristics, which individually might not be detrimental, but together contribute and enhance the cumulative slowing effect present in the gameplay. The previous example with the Claymore actually stems from the popular loadout that included Restock, which resupplies your equipment after a short period of time, combined with a claymore and a trophy system. But it's not just about the one perk and equipment, it's why this particular combo is better than the rest. When you consider the other points made regarding the intended playstyle of the newer games, this is simply an easier, more convenient, and safer way of achieving success. Remember, most people like taking the easy way out, and if the easy way out is sitting on your ass and waiting for enemies to approach you, why wouldn't you customize your loadout to make that strategy even more efficient? Hence, everyone and their mother planning a claymore by the door before mounting up in the window to watch the choke point. On the off chance that someone makes it through the lane, now they have an additional obstacle in the way. Let's even say for sake of argument the flanking opponent knows that the claymore could be there. That doesn't change the fact that more often than not, they have to take their time and approach the situation more slowly than barging through the door. The result? Train go boom. No, the fucking game slows down. And this is my problem with Modern Warfare and the way the devs have since made their games. 
The scenario of the player optimizing their loadout around camping, using a claymore to watch their back, is not the problem. That's the point of the equipment. The problem is when a good chunk of the lobby is doing this or a similar strategy in virtually every game I play. I may make an offhand remark complaining about someone who does this, but I also get more satisfaction when I finally oust them from their spot. This is part of the satisfying gameplay loop of COD, but again, it's historically been the exception and not the norm. When the fundamentals of the game, including its rewards, are structured around this playstyle, these more viable strategies, everyone is either going to have to do it or fight an uphill battle to succeed without it. I feel a few other things tie into this as well as far as loadout and player characteristics go. One thing I do think that contributes to the reward system for this playstyle is the use of kill streaks rather than score streaks by default. I understand that depending on the specific game, there are different ways that this has been approached, but fundamentally, it is tilted towards or just plain forces you to take kill streaks over score streaks. This decision to have kill streaks be the default, or in some case the only option, is yet another contributing factor towards the sentiment why take any other road but the easy one? Modern Warfare in particular requires you to use a perk to change from kill streaks to score streaks. So on top of everything else loudly saying, hey, play like this instead, you have an extra hurdle to contend with in the form of losing one of your three perks to play a certain way. But you know what you could take instead of point man? Restock, to get more claymores, or even hardline just to earn the streaks faster anyway. How about the other CODs since? Well, Cold War, despite operating on the basic premise of score, is more tilted to the prospect of going on killstreaks to get multipliers to the score. While not as stringent as Modern Warfare in its design philosophy overall, this is an aspect that once again tends to favor those who play the incentivized way. Vanguard, on the other hand, didn't have any other option at all, not even a perk. While Modern Warfare 2 allowed you to swap without any kind of penalty, I would argue the design philosophy, that is, the maps, the loadouts, mounting, and doors, that those things within Modern Warfare 2 are fundamentally the closest to Modern Warfare 2019 and that it wants you to play in similar ways. The reality is when you make score streaks, as with most things in life, have barriers to entry, most players are not going to want to deal with those barriers and, like I've said previously, will take the path of least resistance and most success instead. Now let's talk briefly about what I'll call player characteristics. I do feel that in some respects, the time to kill does have an impact on the design philosophy as well. This is a problem more specifically in Modern Warfare, Modern Warfare 2, and perhaps Vanguard, more than Cold War and Modern Warfare 3. But, I think having an above average or higher time to kill would alleviate some of the frustration of people holding sight lines and winning gunfights before you even have time to see where they're hiding. I would generally say that this is what makes Cold War and Modern Warfare 3 better than the other most recent games, but unfortunately, they're still plagued by essentially most of the other aspects that we've discussed. Something else that plays into this as well is the audio and footsteps of moving players. Again, some games have handled this in particular better or worse, but the idea behind this is that if there are no viable means of reducing footsteps, and no, I would not consider the Dead Silence field upgrade to be viable, then players who move less are rewarded more. This has been a chief complaint of the newer CODs, again, more specifically in the Modern Warfare games, but what it amounts to is yet another means in which movement is discouraged and non-movement, and thus non-action, is encouraged. And the more people that do this, the more the map is covered and needs to be maneuvered through carefully, slowly, and sluggishly. How in the fuck is that supposed to be fun? This results in so few encounters that games routinely end through time limit rather than score. Nobody wants to move, and why would you? You're not rewarded for doing so unless you outplay your enemies unless you take the initiative and check every part of the screen for potential threats, unless you dodge the claymores and potential crossfire from enemies in unknown locations. And even after all that time and effort, you could still potentially lose the matchup. Meanwhile, what's little Timmy doing? Sitting there, watching the door or mounted up on a window, warming his claymores by the campfire. There's a reason why Modern Warfare 2019 was jokingly referred to as Window Warfare. Look, it's not like CODs of years past didn't have balancing problems, lackluster weapons, or poor maps, but it always felt like the play space was still the players, where we could experiment with different loadouts, playstyles, strategies, and still engage in CODs core formula that had a design philosophy that prioritized fun and creativity. What irks me the most is that the formula is still present, 
the potential for greatness is still there, but it's heavily diminished, suppressed by the developer's desire to force certain outcomes and playstyles. So what do we get instead? Well, in my experience, it's apathy. I don't have any interest in playing anymore if a majority of the games devolve into the same slow-paced, meticulous, unsatisfying, action-devoid, sleep-inducing gameplay loop. Now there's one final component I feel is part of the design philosophy and expands on the ideas previously discussed regarding the incentives of the player and their means of engaging with the game. An important part of the COD formula is the sense of progression, both in-game and within your profile. Do you know why every time you level up there's a mini spectacle that occurs on your screen? It's because it's intended to get you hyped up at all the progress you've made as a result of the kills you've gotten, the objectives you've scored, the killstreaks you've earned, and the feelings of accomplishment and satisfaction that come with it. When you play a game that has reduced encounters, however, where less of these milestones are reached and on a less frequent basis, it starts to feel stagnant. Imagine if the most you earned every game was 10 kills and maybe a UAV. That's not too bad for any one game, but what if this was the norm and not the exception? Well, it's not very exciting. It means there isn't a lot happening and that feeling of satisfaction, for most people I would assume at least, is not really being reached. And I know what the counter argument to this is. Well, why don't you just get good? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But how about out of game? Weapon levels and unlocks, challenges, prestiges, all this is meant to reinforce a positive feedback loop that keeps the player engaged. This is important because this boils down to motivation, or the reasons why the player continues to engage long after initial exposure. Why does the COD player base generally stop playing at the six month mark? It's because the game has usually been played thoroughly by this point, and there isn't much more to do that's different than six months previously. Consider it this way, you start playing a new COD on release. It feels exciting because there are new weapons to use, new camos to earn, levels to unlock and progress through, but after a while that becomes stale. Now there's nothing wrong with this per se, but the issue I have is that when you combine everything else we've talked about, the fun and engagement seems to come less from the gameplay itself and more about what you can earn through grinding the game. What I mean by this is that, for example, there's only so much entertainment you can get by leveling up past a certain point. Whether that's the player level, the weapon, or the battle pass, each person naturally has their own personal cap where they say to themselves, okay, I played my fill of this game, and they stop. My problem with the newer games specifically is that they seem to have a design philosophy that substitutes the fun of the core gameplay experience with a progression system and an experience that has artificial boundaries. Not just things we've discussed previously, but also including the things that are worth playing for. For those of you who've played the earlier COD games, how easily could you find yourself playing hours and hours without any specific goal or challenge in mind? Was it more about what you were trying to earn or more about the experience itself? For me, I feel that at best, it was more about how much you could win by, what your KD was or how quickly you could rise through the prestiges. Eventually, they included camos that actually felt rewarding to earn, and also were a means of distinction between yourself, your weapon, and everyone else. You could argue the same was true for things like emblems and calling cards. And now? Well, it's kind of hard to give a shit knowing that I can get a cooler skin by just buying it. It's hard to care about leveling up my weapons when I know it will take forever to grind through the levels, especially when every weapon is designed like this. It's hard to care about player levels or this half-assed seasonal prestige, when I know that I'm either going to be artificially capped until the new season starts, or that I can go AFK in Warzone and earn just as much XP as multiplayer, but without the hassle or uphill battle that it was designed with. What's the result? A lack of incentive. I don't want to play because the core gameplay is tedious. It doesn't feel rewarding on its own. And so I feel the only incentive to play is to earn those other rewards like the completionist camo or to finish the battle pass. Neither of which are too satisfying to earn on their own, and are usually less impressive than items that can be purchased. There's a reason for me personally that Modern Warfare was the last game where I earned the completionist camo, because ever since then it's either been a lackluster reward, or the process itself is not worth that reward. I would add on to this that depending on the game, even the camo challenges contribute to the slow pacing because of their requirements. Get 50 crouch kills. Get 50 long shots. Get 50 mount kills. Get 50 prone kills. Christ, nothing gets me more excited like sitting still all game. I'm really on the edge of my seat here. Now as a final note on this concept, I want to talk about buying versus earning rewards. 
I'm not here to trash the shop since I'm not a broke boy, but I do wish at the very least that the rewards you could earn were either A, more impressive, distinct, and unique, or B, more satisfying to earn because of a more fun gameplay experience. Because it's neither, I don't personally feel the incentive to play COD for more than a few games at a time before it becomes frustrating or worse, boring. Now I want to make a note of a few other things that I feel are important with regards to my declining lack of interest in COD. Something that I feel has contributed to COD's longevity is that despite having the same fundamentals present, for better or worse, each game still looked visually different. I think the initial appeal of both Modern Warfare 2019 and Warzone was that the devs drastically overhauled the visuals of the game, making it have more updated and more realistic visuals, crisp sound effects, and a different flow to character movement. And while I would argue this overhaul may have resulted in the decision to use a milsim color palette, which in my opinion does a disservice to the gameplay, at least in the Modern Warfare games, I think a subsequent consequence of it is the UI that came with it, and not just in game either. The visuals and information on screen in each new Call of Duty are virtually identical to the previous one in these newer games. Let's take a look at this, shall we? Right out of the gate, there's not much distinction in the menus, the things happening outside of the game. The game loads up the same, the pre-game lobby is virtually the same, create a class system is the same. Now you could argue this is an instance of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but I think that, like the aspects of design philosophy, the UI itself contributes to a larger problem, which is that of stagnation. I also firmly believe that this is a direct result of the Warzone era and that the devs, whether out of convenience or laziness, are relying on the same things because it has to appeal to Warzone players. My issue is that as someone who has very little interest in Warzone, I don't want to play entirely different modes that all make me feel like I'm playing Warzone. I'm already tired of playing multiplayers that all play too similarly, and now you also make nearly every facet of them look the same too. I recall one of the biggest complaints back in the day was that Modern Warfare 2 and Modern Warfare 3 were too similar, and those criticisms were valid. So what did they decide to do all these years later? Well, how about instead of two games within the one subseries looking identical, let's do five going on six games from three subseries. The result of this is that every aspect of every new game, even the campaign apparently, thanks Modern Warfare 3, feels like every other part of the game, which is all derived from Warzone. It's hard to compartmentalize the experience, which I might add once again, I'm already finding difficulty in enjoying due to the design philosophy. I mean, just look at this. This was stale at least one or two iterations ago, but they keep reusing the same assets. Even when they have different theming to the games, in the sense that the era, the characters, and the weapons are still somewhat different, everything else around them is not. In my opinion, even if this issue alone is not massively tiresome, I think it does contribute to the feeling of complacency and apathy regarding the newer games when you consider everything else on top of this. There is something that I feel is important to mention regarding my continued interest of Call of Duty multiplayer that is beyond the games themselves. The thing is, I've been playing multiplayer for a long time. Hell, I've been playing games for a long time. And the reality of it is that gaming culture has evolved and changed a lot over the last 20 years. For all the Call of Duty boomers who also complain about how COD just isn't the same anymore, man. The fact of the matter is that it's fucking true. We can sit here and go in circles about the problems in the industry, the trends, the monetization, the culture, but none of that brings back Modern Warfare 2. And by the way, it will never go back to that point. The reason is because gaming culture has transformed as a result of technology and social media. As the games industry has grown, so have the types of experiences and the types of people playing. The costs and budgets have gone up, and the ways to spend and earn money in games have adapted to it. The ability to see guides and strategies online has changed how things can be approached in games, and arguably how they have to be made to compensate for this. Perhaps the biggest change of all is YouTube and streaming. Gaming is not just a source of entertainment to play, but also to watch. The formation of the competitive scene and the desire to be the best has led to the need to play the meta, as different players compete in game or compete for viewers. The consequence of this is that the elements within the games are meticulously examined to determine what gives players even the most minute edge over others. So when you see people running around with the exact same loadouts, with the exact same weapons and attachments, it can contribute to a stale and monotonous experience where it feels like if you don't also use the exact same thing, then you are at a disadvantage. It doesn't feel unique to me as a player if I know most people are using the same thing I am. 
and that I also feel forced to use it lest I, or let's say streamers competing for viewers, fall behind. Another important aspect is that as gaming has grown over the years and become more easily accessible, people start playing earlier and more frequently. The result is that when it comes to Call of Duty, for example, people today are much better at the game than people who were playing years ago. Being good at online shooters like Modern Warfare 2 back in 2009 is not the same as being good at online shooters like Black Ops 6 today, because overall way less people had years of experience back in 2009 than they do now simply because online gaming was newer and less established back then. While I don't believe any of this necessarily negates my criticisms of newer COD games, I think it's important to put things in perspective that the design philosophy of the games, whether I personally agree with them or not, is made in part so that the series can adapt and thrive amongst significantly more competition in an ever-growing industry. On a similar but vastly more controversial note, I'd like to take a minute to discuss skill-based matchmaking and its impact on the newer games. I made a few references earlier to the idea that part of what makes the gameplay loop feel so tedious, slow, or frustrating is because it's inherently an uphill battle more times than not. A counter-argument is that a player who is truly more skilled than their opponent could still outmaneuver, in at least some cases. The fact that their opponent may be hiding behind a door, or mounting up in a window with a claimer watching their back, but this assumes that there's a skill gap to begin with. And the tragic reality is that skill-based matchmaking on top of the concept of more viable strategies like the ones just referenced, further contribute to the skill gap narrowing. If there are two players of equal skill, but one uses a clearly advantageous weapon or strategy that the game incentivizes, what could the outcome possibly be? It's not exactly difficult to see why this repeated experience helps contribute to a lack of interest in playing further. As we discussed previously, it seems as if the developer's intentions is to narrow the skill gap through design philosophy, lowering the threshold for success and therefore fun so that any player can reach it. Skill-based matchmaking is essentially an extension of that. Think of it this way. Imagine a scale with you on one side and your opponent on the other. The design philosophy that ultimately fucks with the pacing of the game is the developer's way of artificially trying to balance the scales so that both players are on roughly the same playing field. Bear in mind that they view this as a means of trying to maintain player retention and engagement. So now it's essentially harder for you, but easier for them. However, as I also mentioned previously, I would argue that there isn't anything wrong with this concept per se, as challenge can be fun and satisfying when appropriately handled. With that being said, when it happens with such frequency, and when it comes at the cost of player agency and control of their experience, in this case, forcing them to play a similar and very particular playstyle in order to ultimately succeed, then it's a major fucking problem. But here's the kicker. Skill-based matchmaking is like grabbing the scale with your hand in an attempt to keep them even. The formula for the developers is to make sure every metric is accounted for to get exact equilibrium. Where this absolutely loses me as a player is when it's applied so heavily in conjunction with the forced playstyle as to basically predetermine the outcome of the match. And what is the outcome exactly besides me losing interest in playing? The closest game imaginable, scores that do their absolute damnedest to be at even at all times and to keep your KD as close to 1.0 throughout your entire experience. Now does this happen every game? Eh, not necessarily, you know, but in my case it ends up being a majority. Enough where I find it difficult to play for more than a few games at a time. So much for player retention. Now, like any good scientist, I feel the need to point out where my personal biases may exist in my analysis. I think the most obvious one is that I'm basing my experiences with the newer games on what I alone can see and deal with. I'm certain that there's many of you watching who might find some of my points, made to the best of my abilities, to be unrelatable. I have a hunch though that there's many of you like myself who have the experiences with older COD games, who are looking at the new ones like... Gotta be fucking kidding. But that's the thing, isn't it? They're older games, made in a different time, with a different philosophy, different intentions, and for a different audience. The reality is that I don't think these new games were made for me. I'm also willing to embrace the fact that my interest in COD and its increasingly competitive culture is probably just waning naturally as I get older. Nothing wrong with that per se, 
but as I view other people's feedback and criticism surrounding the franchise, I think some people forget both the need for some self-awareness as well as the power of nostalgia. And so I think it's valid to point out that it's okay to enjoy the newer games or not. It's just a game at the end of the day. And as I've discovered myself playing things for the first time on my channel, there's plenty of other shit out there to enjoy instead. What's the, hey, what's up with this one? This is a big yellow block. No shit, really? I, I did, am I fucking, you think I'm blind or what? And to be perfectly clear, let me get this right out of the way out of the bat. I am more on the... Yeah, I'm a big fan of the franchise, believe it or not. I do love the Call of Duty franchise. I've been playing it for over half my life and covering it for 13 years here on YouTube. I mean, Call of Duty is a big part of my identity as a person, you could say. End of the spectrum rather than... You dumb son of a bitch. What in the fuck am I playing for? Why am I playing this hard? For what? Side as far as my desire for COD to be enjoyable, despite how frustrating and tiresome the new games make me feel overall, I must reiterate my point that underneath some of these intertwined problems that we've talked about is a franchise that still offers a great value. And hopefully they happen to make a game in the future that I can enjoy and resonate with on a more consistent basis. And I must stress this as well. I don't think my distaste for the new style of games is a result of burnout. If anything, playing these games to get footage for this video is the first time I've touched the multiplayers in a long time. The only exception to this being Modern Warfare 3. I have played a fair amount of Warzone over the years, but truth be told, I've hardly gotten any time invested in the multiplayer as compared to the games prior to Modern Warfare. In fact, this is the first time I've played Vanguard since the beta and I only managed to get one game before I was unable to find another one. I tried searching through the different modes, the combat pacings and whatnot for about 30 minutes and I never found another game. The point is, is that to be fair in my criticisms, Vanguard might be somewhat of an outlier because the problems I've described were only things that I found in the beta. Another thing that is worth mentioning that I feel is important, while most of my criticisms apply to all the newer games in at least some capacity, I do think it's worth mentioning that the problems specifically with the map design and slow pacing have gotten tepidly better over the years. I think this is one of the complaints that people have with the release of Modern Warfare 3, that it was basically a full priced update fixing some of the shit that was still present by the time Modern Warfare 2 came out. I'm not sure if this is a matter of the developers being stubborn, as if they're saying, and, and by the way, you don't want to, that, to do that either. You think you do, but you don't. Or they really have data that suggests people want the things we've talked about in the multiplayers. Either way, what I've noticed is that with each new release since Modern Warfare, they've been slowly crawling back from the dog shit design philosophy that that game had. I wouldn't say by any stretch of the imagination that I like Modern Warfare 3, but I can say that I tolerate it longer than the games that have come before it. Now to wrap this video up, I'd like to briefly mention the upcoming release of Black Ops 6. I think Cold War's multiplayer was just a different shade of unfun, but I do think it did things that were better than the Modern Warfare games, specifically removing mounting and making the game a little bit more colorful. But I like to think that Treyarch has an approach to the multiplayer that I generally enjoy more than Infinity Ward, who has been directing the ship the last several years. The Black Ops 6 beta made positive steps in the right direction, but it remains to be seen if it can break the chains first forged in Modern Warfare that, in my opinion, have been holding the franchise back since. Let me know you guys' thoughts on the things I went over, and thanks for watching.